All right, welcome everyone. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a specific type of improper integral, which we call a p-form. So by the end of this lesson, you're gonna be able to determine whether one of these p-form improper integrals is convergent or divergent. And actually, if it's convergent, you'll be able to evaluate it as well. So let's, let's get into it. And we start with our main result. So these are our p-form integrals right here. The integral from one to infinity of one over x to the power p. And the convergence or divergence of this improper integral, it really depends on that value for p. And this is really what we're going to be investigating. And we can actually come up with the conclusion here that says this improper integral is convergent when p is greater than 1 and it's divergent when p is less than or equal to 1. And we're actually going to show these, these results. So that's what this whole lesson is going to center around, is investigating these types of improper integrals, 1 over x to the power p. Now why these are important is we're going to be using these in one of our, well, not one of, in some of our later lessons when we start talking about sequences and series. So these are going to show back up. All right, so we're going to prove this result. We're going to show that these improper integrals are convergent when p is greater than 1, but divergent when p is less than or equal to 1. And you can see there's a few different cases here for what the value for p is. And that has to do with how we actually find the antiderivative of this function. So let's look at the antiderivative of the function 1 over x to the power p. And we know that for the most part, we would be able to do these, we would be able to integrate these by rewriting it as x to the power negative p. So we would rewrite with a negative exponent. and then just use power rule. But that doesn't always work. So there is one possible value for p here where the antiderivative is slightly different. So there's, there's really two cases here. There's the case where p is equal to 1. And this was true when we first learned power rule way back in Calc 1. If we're trying to integrate the function 1 over x to the, um, well, if we're trying to integrate the function just 1 over x, that power rule doesn't work for this one. We have to use, this is just something special. The antiderivative is natural log absolute value x. So power rule doesn't work. But for all the other ones, this is the only special one. All the other ones, all of the other p-values, they're going to work here. Power rule is going to work. So we would be able to do power rule. So in general, if p does not equal 1, then our function will keep it as x to the power negative p, have it written as a negative exponent. That's our usual strategy. And then from there, finding the antiderivative is just a matter of power rule. So what do we do? We keep our variable the same, add 1 to the exponent, so it goes up to negative p plus 1, take that new exponent, flip it, put it in front. So this is just power rule. So you can see here, there's a few different cases going on really centered around how we find the antiderivative of this function. So if p is equal to 1, it, it's it, we have to do this. It's a special case. If p doesn't equal 1, then we can just use power rule. And so we're going to, when we actually go through and prove that improper integral results, we're going to break this up into three cases. So we're going to break it up into the case when p is equal to 1, 
and when p is greater than 1, and when p is less than 1. So we're going to consider three different cases here for actually proving that improper integral result. So let's start with the case where p is equal to 1. So in this case, our integral is the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x. Now this is an improper integral. We know it's an improper integral because we're dealing with an infinite um, interval here. So we're looking at the interval from 1 to infinity. So the very first step for dealing with these is we rewrite it as a limit. So we're going to do the limit as b approaches infinity. And then we're going to be looking at the definite integral from 1 to b. And then our, our function 1 over x and then dx. So this is standard improper integral work here. Rewrite it as a limit. So we take the infinity off of the upper limit and we're, we're, making, we're turning this into a limit statement. So that's our step one. Step two is actually do the integration. So we have this nice definite integral now, so we can do the integration. So we find the antiderivative. Still have our limit here. Um, our antiderivative is natural log absolute value x, and then we'll evaluate that from x equals 1 to x equals b. Now we evaluate, just like normal. So take that top number, plug it in. Take the lower bound, plug it in. In that case, it's 1. And subtract. And so this is all step two from our, our normal process here of going through and calculating one of these improper integrals. Step one, rewrite it as a limit. Step two, find the antiderivative, evaluate, just like you would normally do for a regular definite integral. All right, so we get to this point. Um, there's a little bit of simplifying we can do. So the natural log of one is, is uh, zero. And Another thing we can do is b is approaching infinity. So b is ultimately becoming a large positive number. So if we wanted to, we could drop the absolute value here. So b, we can assume here is positive and be able to drop the absolute value if we wanted to. But I'll just leave it in. So we've simplified it down. And now the last step is to, to figure out what this limit is. And natural log, this is one of our functions we should know what the limit is, the limit at infinity is. So as the number we're plugging into the natural log function gets larger and larger positive, the natural log function also gets larger and larger positive. So this is equal to infinity, positive infinity. So this is just a result we should know. This was one of our important limits at infinity that we discussed a few lessons ago when we were looking at uh, these types of improper integrals. And so what this means is if we follow, follow, the, follow along here, we've shown that this improper integral is equal to infinity, and so it's divergent. All right, so that shows that the case p equals 1 is divergent. All right, now let's look at one of the other cases. And which one should we look at? p greater than 1, why not? Sure. All right, so let's start it off. It's going to start off pretty much the same way. We're going to write this, write our improper integral, our p form here, 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the power p. Um, it's an improper integral, infinite, uh, infinite interval here from 1 to infinity. So always the same first step, rewrite this thing as a limit. So that's step one, rewrite it as a limit. Step two now is to actually go through the process of calculating this definite integral. And... We've already seen how to find this antiderivative uh, a few slides back, so we'll just write that down. 
So this is why we've had to break this into cases is because P is greater than one, um, we, can, we can actually apply the power rule to actually find this antiderivative. So the power rule wouldn't work if P was equal to one. And we saw that we had to, to kind of use that special case. Um, and if we go back, what is the, the antiderivative of one over X to the power P when we can use power rule? Well, it's this right here. So we're gonna use this, this one over negative P plus one times X to the negative P plus one. All right, so our antiderivative, what did I say? I already forgot it. <laughs> um, one over negative P plus one X to the negative P plus one. Yeah, that's our antiderivative. And we're going to evaluate that from x equals 1 to x equals b. Now we plug in. So this is finding the antiderivative. Now we plug in. So top number goes in first. We get 1, one over negative p plus 1 times b raised to the negative p plus 1. And then we plug 1 in. And when we plug 1 in, 1 raised to any power is going to be just 1. So we're just going to end up with this um, 1 over negative p plus 1, and then we subtract. So you could write you know, plugging the 1 in, but 1 raised to that power is just going to be 1. All right, so now we need to figure out this limit. And let's see how this is going to work. And we really need to look at what's happening with this exponent, this negative p plus 1. So we're in the case where, where 1 is less than p or p is greater than 1. And we want to figure out what's going on with this exponent, this negative p plus 1. Is this positive or is it negative? And what we can do is, starting with this inequality, if we were to subtract p from both sides, so subtract p from this side, subtract p from this side, we would get negative p plus 1 is less than 0. And what we're seeing here is that negative p plus 1, this exponent, is it's less than 0, so it's negative. So we're really interested in figuring out, to, to calculate this limit, we're interested really in what happens to this b term here because we're doing the limit as b goes to infinity. Everything else, these, these other fractions here, these are just constants. So we know that they're, they're not going to change at all. They're, they're just going to stay constant terms. Really, all of the action is happening right here with this b term. So we need to figure out what's happening there. So let's kind of do this off to the side. Let's look at this one um, limit of just b to uh, the limit as b goes to infinity of b raised to the negative p plus 1. And we know that exponent, negative p plus 1, is negative. So to really emphasize that, let's just rename this. Just to maybe not make this look so intimidating. So let's rename it negative n, where n is is just some positive number. So negative p plus 1 is just some negative number. And let's rename it negative n. It's a negative number, where n is some positive. And it'll make this look a little bit nicer. So we're just renaming it. So we're, we're really saying here, let negative p plus 1 equal negative n. Just to make this 
look a little bit more what we're used to in terms of calculating limits. So we're just renaming that exponent. We know it's negative, so we're saying let this equal negative n. And the reason for this is because in this format, we want to rewrite this as a fraction. one over b to the power n. And we know how to calculate this limit. This limit is zero because these are also a type of limit that we talked about a few lessons ago. These are, are the one over infinity forms. So what's happening in this fraction, as b is getting larger and larger positive, because this is b raised to a positive integer n, this b to the power n is also getting larger and larger. And so we have this fraction where it's 1 over, the, con the numerator is staying constant, but the denominator is getting larger and larger. And so when that happens, the whole fraction goes to 0. So what we've just shown is that this b raised to the negative p plus 1, the limit of that is equal to 0. And so we can use that result up here. This whole piece is going to 0, and what we're left with is this negative 1 over negative p plus 1. And then if we distribute that negative into the denominator, we end up with 1 over 1 uh, uh, p minus 1. And so what we've just shown, this is a perfectly good number because it's only undefined when p is equal to 1, but we already took care of that case. We're in the world now where p is greater than 1. So this is a perfectly good number. And what we've just shown is that the improper integral in this case is convergent with value equal to 1 over p minus 1. So it not only is it convergent, but we know what it converges to, 1 over p minus 1. So we had this little inequality. We had to work with this inequality. And you know, step two was finding the antiderivative, evaluating it. And step three took a little bit of work here. And this is where we really used the, the property that 1 is less than p. Because that influenced what was happening to this power of b here. It ended up being a fraction with all the b terms in the denominator, which went to 0. Now, if we go to the last case, the last case is when p is less than 1. And we know in that case we're still going to be able to use power rule. So all of this work is going to be exactly the same. Everything is going to be exactly the same up through this right here. It's only the limit part, this type of calculation, that's going to change. So we're in the case now where p is less than 1. And so all of that all of that middle work is going to be the same and we're going to end up with exactly the same limit to calculate. 1 over negative b plus 1 times b raised to the negative p plus 1 minus 1 over negative p plus 1. It's it's a mouthful here, but we're we're getting it. Um, so all of these steps are the same. So all of these steps are the same. So we're gonna we would end up with the same thing, same antiderivative, evaluate it the exact same way. But now what's going to be different in this case is what actually happens to this limit. So we're still interested in what does this power of b, what is this power of b doing? 
So that's what we really want to investigate here. What is the limit of b raised to the negative p plus 1 as b gets larger and larger? And so we need to look at that exponent. So if this exponent is a negative number, then it's just going to become a fraction and the fraction will go to 0. But if this exponent is positive, then when we have a big number raised to a positive exponent, it's just going to get bigger and bigger. And so the, the limit would be infinity. So let's see what happens. So we're going to start with our inequality for this case, when p is less than 1. And we want to make it match up with what we have in the exponent here, this negative p plus 1. So I want to subtract p from both sides, just like we did in the last case. And when I do that, I get negative, well, I get 0 on the left. And then I'm going to have negative p plus 1. So if we look at this, what this is saying is that negative p plus 1 is greater than 0. So it's positive. So our exponent is a positive number. So to help think about this, let's again, let's just rename this. Instead of having negative p plus 1, let's... We're going to let negative p plus 1, we know it's a positive integer, so let negative p plus 1 equal m. Now, we know it's a positive number. So let's just really emphasize that and say, let's set this equal to just some positive number m. So m is a positive number. So we're just renaming this just to really emphasize the fact that negative p plus 1 is positive. It's a positive number. So when we go down to actually calculate this limit, we're going to have b raised to the power m, where m is a positive number. And we've seen these limits before. So when the base of our power function here gets larger and larger power uh, positive, the whole power function also gets larger and larger positive, and that's because this is a positive exponent. If it was a negative exponent, well, then it would be acting like a fraction, and the fraction would be getting smaller and smaller. But because this is a positive exponent, this whole b raised to this power m, or more specifically, b raised to the negative p plus 1, is getting larger and larger. So this is going to go to infinity. And so what we end up with is this limit ends up being infinity. So this is a positive in front here because we know negative p plus 1 is positive, so this fraction is positive. We know this is getting larger and larger positive, so it goes to infinity. And then it doesn't really matter if we subtract off a little bit. Um, it's still getting larger and larger overall. So what we just showed is that in this case, the improper integral is divergent. And that does it. We've shown the three cases, and we can summarize them just as the main statement said. So for the case when p was less than 1, we showed divergent. For p greater than 1, we showed convergent. And for p equal to 1, we showed divergent. And this is what our main result said. It said convergent when p is greater than 1, divergent when p is less than or equal to 1. So we've shown those, we've shown this result. So that we, we did the proof. All right, so how are we going to use this result? Well, it's going to be nice because then we can quickly kind of analyze um, these types of improper integrals. So example one, determine if the following improper integral is convergent or divergent. Here we have the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x squared. And we see that this is a p-form integral. It's a p-form improper integral with what is the p-value p is equal to 2. p is the power on 
the exponent uh, is the exponent there. It's x raised to the power two, so p is equal to two here. And since p equal to two is greater than one, that tells us this improper integral is convergent. And so we're able to quickly analyze whether this specific type of improper integral is convergent or divergent. So we can quickly say um, this one is convergent. Let's try another one. Example two, improper integral of one to infinity of one over square root x dx. We wanna be able to analyze if this is convergent or divergent. Um, now, the only thing we might need to do here is just rewrite this with as a power function. So we might want to rewrite it as 1 over x to the 1 half power. That might be the only little bit of work we would need here. But rewriting it like that, we can quickly see that this is a p-form improper integral. So this is a p-form improper integral. with p equal to 1 half. And since p equal to 1 half is less than 1, that tells us this improper integral is divergent. So we're able to quickly say whether this improper integral is convergent or divergent. And in this case, it's divergent. Just because that power is less than one and actually less than or equal to one because if it was equal to one it'd still be divergent all right so we're able to quickly analyze these and this is going to be helpful like i said once we get to sequences and series we're going to be kind of dealing with these p forms again um all right so one one last result um, we can actually kind of relax the starting point of our improper integral. And the general result is still true. So if we kind of let the starting point of our interval here be just some number a, which is greater than zero, the improper integral, we can still think of it as one of our p-forms, and it still holds with the same result. It's convergent when p is greater than 1 and divergent when p is less than or equal to 1. So the same result still applies. Um, one little thing to be careful of here is we, do, we can't relax it too much. So we can't let a become e equal to 0 or negative because then our function becomes undefined. So just a little warning, you can't get too relaxed. We can relax it a, we can re relax that a bit. So it doesn't have to be a 1 here. It could be really any positive number. The result is still true. Um, but we can't equal 0 or can't become negative. So the function one over x to the power p. Um, could potentially be undefined. At a equals zero or, um, well, at a equals zero, which, what would happen in that case? Well, then we would have another, that would make this, a, <laughs> that would be like um, two, instances of improper integrals here. There would be a discontinuity, an infinite limit at the one endpoint, and then we'd also have, this would be an improper integral because we're dealing with an infinite interval. So we, we would have to treat that a little bit, we'd have to be careful with how we, how we handled that. So um, just be warned about a equals zero here. Our function might become undefined, which would make it discontinuous, we'd actually have an infinite discontinuity at a equals zero, which would make this another type of improper integral. 
So just to be warned. All right, so we can relax this. Just be careful about zero and negative numbers because then you might have an in infinite discontinuity. All right, so how can we use this? Well, example three. Determine if the following improper integral is convergent or divergent. Here we have the improper integral of one over x dx from five to infinity. And what we see here is that this is not equal to one, it's equal to five, um, but the general result is still true. So this is a p-form improper integral. Now, what is our p-value? Well, p is equal to 1 here. So you're looking at the exponent. And if you don't see anything explicitly written, well, then it's just understood that the exponent there is 1. So this is a p-form improper integral with p equal to 1. And since p equal to 1 is less than or equal to 1, that's true, um, this integral is divergent. From our, from our main results, with the kind of allowance here that if we start at five, the result is still true. So this improper integral would be still divergent. So shaving off a little bit at the start there really doesn't adjust enough to the fact that this improper integral is gonna is 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 equal to infinity. It's gonna be really big. So shaving off a little bit at the beginning doesn't really do much. So the the result is still gonna be divergent. Um, all right, so. That's really it. So not not too bad. Um, we're gonna be using these though. So you wanna keep these kind of tucked away. We're gonna be using these pretty soon when we start talking about sequences and series. Um, so we're, we're gonna come back. So it's gonna be nice to have this result that we can kind of quickly refer back to, which will allow us to, to quickly identify whether an improper, whether these types of specific types of improper integrals are convergent or divergent. Um, all right, so we're going to stop there. Have a nice uh, rest of your day, and then we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.